This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Thank you and welcome everybody. It's an honor for me to be here uh, to speak before the Center for Health Quality and Innovation and Implementation. Uh, I'm Mark Larratt, CEO of UCSF Medical Center. Uh, you know, I, I listened to uh, Dr. Jack Sobo, who has done an enormous job for bringing UC Health together. Uh, I listened to Terry, who talks about the effect of healthcare on every aspect of our, of our world, and I'm reminded that uh, David Feinberg, who runs UCLA Medical Center, and I both sit on a, uh, a round table, and uh, a few weeks ago we had a presentation by a former HHS Secretary, uh, Mike Levitt, who is also the former governor of Utah, a devout Mormon. And he was uh, explaining that uh, just uh, at the Easter services at his church, uh, the uh, head of the Sunday school was talking to the kids about Jesus and dying on the cross and, uh, and so forth. And he, he asked the kids, now, can anybody tell me what the resurrection is? There was silence in the room until one kid raised his hand and says, well, I'm not exactly sure but I've heard from TV that if you have one that lasts for more than four hours, <laughs> you should call a doctor instantly. <laughs> Healthcare is in everything that we do. I'm, uh, I've had the privilege, some might say I'm a masochist, that I've worked not just at one UC campus, but at three. I began my career at UCLA Medical Center. I was there for 15 years, five years at UC Irvine, and uh, now 13 years here at UCSF Medical Center. Uh, and I've also, this past year, had the, the privilege of serving as the chairman of the Association of American Medical Colleges, which is the primary trade association for the 100, and I think now, Jack, it's 143 medical schools and over 400 teaching hospitals. And what I have seen over the years, and I know like many of you, is that we are doing an extraordinary job in academic medicine to alleviate suffering and improve the quality of life for people, not just in our local communities or in California, but around the world. That we're leading the way in discovery in the individual and community health. And we have done a, an extraordinary job in training the next generation of caregivers to provide the highest level of care and caring. It really is a remarkable story. And we see it played out in very personal ways. When my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer about four years ago, she was spared chemotherapy because of the work of a company called Genomic Health that was able to profile her, the genetic makeup of her particular tumor. And that research started in our laboratories inside UC. Some people see the extraordinary work of UC uh, in a brilliant young primary care physician serving an underserved community, courtesy of our PRIME program. Uh, others see it uh, in a family holding its collective breath as an infant is nursed back to health in one of our neonatal intensive care units, or any person is saved in one of our great trauma centers. You know, society really admires what we do in academic medicine and what we stand for. When people need the best, they come to us. And I hope you take great pride in the role that you play in this endeavor, as I do, of being associated not only in academic medicine in general, but with the University of California in particular. But in case you haven't noticed, in spite of the great causes we stand for and the remarkable work we've done, our world in academic medicine is at great peril. Start with unprecedented budget cuts to education. State support to the University of California has fallen by more than 30%. And there is no prospect 
no realistic prospect that that 30 percent is ever going to return. We see at UCSF that we are losing medical students to Harvard, Stanford, and Penn because it's cheaper for students to go there with those, the endowments and the support that they'll have there than it is to pay the, the out-of-state uh, tuition uh, that they would have at UCSF. Across the nation and across UC, tuition and student debt are at an all-time high. How about the NIH? The doubling of federal investment in medical research is a distant memory now. Now an inflationary increase is a best case scenario. As a result, we're seeing some of our best and brightest young scientists completely discouraged about pursuing an academic career. Clinical income is under siege. Medicare and Medicaid already fail to cover the cost of providing care in our teaching hospitals. And professional reimbursement from these payers is so low that many physicians no longer see Medicaid patients, Medi-Cal patients, or Medicare patients. Yet in every deficit reduction program, every one, Medicare and Medicaid budgets will be significantly cut. Cuts to disproportionate share payments that have been extremely important to the five UC medical centers are just around the corner. Indirect and direct medical education supplements are under attack. And the new insurance exchange threatens to displace commercial payments that have propped up our UC medical centers and most teaching hospitals around the country. And look what's happened to commercial insurance. Contract rates that we've negotiated don't hold when employers tell the health plan we're not going to pay those rates. Health plans come back and we end up renegotiating new lower rates. Clinical income now covers not only the cost of operating our clinical enterprises, but increasingly it's covering the cost of the education and research mission. As clinical income falls, the entire academic enterprise of each of our centers is threatened as never before. And this is just a partial list. We could go on, it's, it, but it's not just the number in the magnitude of the changes raining down on us, it's the rapidity which with they are coming at us. And further, we don't have any influential friends who are really standing up on our behalf. President Obama, both parties in Congress, and in fact society at large, seem to agree on one thing. They are demanding a change in society's long-standing compact with academic medicine. They are saying to us, in short, yes, we appreciate and admire what you do, cutting-edge research, training excellent physicians and other caregivers, providing exceptional medical care, and we want to get it from you, too, when we need it. Keep it up. Do more of it. Do it better. And by the way, we're going to cut what we pay you to do it. Individually and collectively, we will continue our fight to fend off the NIH, Medicare, and Medi-Cal cuts to bolster support for education, temper regulatory expectations, but let's just really be honest about it. The overwhelming political and economic sentiment today is that our nation spends far too much on health care. Along with the economic downturn and fervor to reduce federal deficits, the fact is that few of our advocacy efforts are likely to yield more than modest, modest tweaks around the edges. The die has really been cast. Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel once famously said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I believe, and I'd like to convince you today, that the crisis we have at hand is in fact a great opportunity if only we have the courage to grasp it. It won't be painless and it won't be quick. As Thomas Alva Edison said, quote, opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. That's what this opportunity is. It's dressed in overalls and looks like work. So let me set the framework for the change I believe we can and must make. My slide is up. Some of you may recall this 1994 book, Built to Last, 
Successful Habits of Visionary Companies by Jim Collins and Jerry Porras. They compared similarly sized companies in similar industries over time and attempted to identify the key variables that enabled some companies to achieve far greater success than their comparators. Collins and Porras argued that when organizations face a changing world, the first question the visionary ones ask is not, how should we change? Instead, the visionary organizations first ask, what do we stand for and why do we exist? The answer to that question becomes the stable, unchanging rock on which their enterprise is built, leaving all else subject to change. As they said it best, visionary companies distinguish their timeless core values and enduring purpose, which should never change, from their operating practices and business strategies, which should be changing constantly in response to a changing world. Their yin-yang diagram differentiates what should never be changed and always be preserved, core values and core purpose, from what should and must change, cultural and operating practices, and specific goals and business strategies. And let me suggest to you that our values in UC, in UC Health, and in fact in all of academic medicine, are really stated very simply. With high ethical standards and a belief in the value of every human, our mission is to train the next generation of caregivers to carry out the biomedical and population health research and to care for our patients and our communities. That's, that's what we're all about. That's what UC stands for. But if, as Collins and Porras suggest, all else in academic medicine is changeable, in fact needs to be a changed to accommodate to a changing world, everything about how we are structured and organized must be in play. Everything about our academic culture, with regents, provosts, deanery, the academic senate, what one legislator once told me sounds like a cross between the Vatican and the British monarchy, said all that's in play. Everything about how we educate students and residents, how we deliver care, how we organize ourselves for research is in play. And imagine that we had the insight and the courage to make the right changes. Might we not only achieve our current values and core purpose, but do so more effectively than we ever imagined at dramatically reduced cost. Do what we're doing now better at lower cost. For example, could we find a way to train more physicians and caregivers with the unprecedented diversity of skills they will need better and more quickly at a cost much lower than the tuition we charge today? There are, in fact, for-profit medical schools who are producing licensed physicians for the cost of tuition. And if there's a, we need to define in our minds what it is that is different about the quality of the education that we provide than what they provide and be able to, to define the cost, the appropriate cost for that delta in value. Could we design a research enterprise that's not only self-supporting, but dramatically accelerates the pace of discovery? and its implementation, translation of those discoveries into the care of patients? Could we design a clinical care system that effectively manages chronic disease and drives significant improvements in the health of individuals and communities using far fewer resources than today? If we had the luxury of time, and in those flip charts around this hall, I'm sure we could identify the answers to many of these questions. But I would posit to you that our central challenge in academic medicine, this is the central problem that we have. We like change, but we want others to make it. We're very fond of our traditions about how we carry out our work. We more or less model our institutions after this place. You recognize this, Dr. Stobo? What, where is this? This is Johns Hopkins. We more or less model every academic medical center after Johns Hopkins, in a lot of ways, like every golf course is designed as 18 holes because St. Andrews has 18 holes, the first golf course. So we think we need to have the comprehensive list 
of specialties, fellowships, et cetera, that Johns Hopkins has. We hold on to decision-making processes long ago abandoned by organizations needing to be facile in a changing world, decision-making processes that look remarkably like this. Let me provoke you with a few examples of ways that we, need to change, that we need to carry out our missions that I believe must be reconsidered. I offer this risk, this list at a risk of needing to join a witness protection program after this speech. In the research community, do our committees on academic promotion overvalue the R01, the article in the single word journal, Cell, Nature, Science, or being first or last author at the expense of team science? where we know many of the next important discoveries will emerge? Are we snobs when it comes to working with industry, where billions have been invested in genomic infrastructure? While we salute the physician scientist who is eligible to go get his, first, his or her first R01 at the age of 41 or 2, do our basic scientists truly embrace collaboration with surgeons? In the education community, why does medical school still take four years? Is the 100-year-old Flexner model still right for today? Why is so much accreditation still time-based when we've been talking about competency-based accreditation for years? Why is there so little training in residencies across specialties and other health professions? And isn't it appalling that we still sometimes hear the joke that you don't want to be hospitalized in a teaching hospital in July. In the patient care community, why is inpatient care still the center of our world? Is it because we have become addicted to the reimbursement associated with inpatient care and that has kept us from seamlessly integrating beyond ambulatory care to skilled nursing, mental health, rehab, home care, and hospice? Why can't we discharge a patient by 11? Why does the physician office visit, as Terry pointed out, why is the physician office visit, which you might argue is the single least efficient model for delivering care, still persist as the common denominator for our health care models? For our institutions, why do we think it's reasonable to appoint a stellar academic with zero business experience to run a $30 million departmental operation with 100 employees? I think this is the moment when questions like this, and thousands more, deserve to be evaluated and answered thoughtfully and unemotionally. But our opportunity isn't limited to changing or abandoning some current practices. Our new opportunities will have roots in truly thinking differently about academic medicine. For example, what kinds of new collaborations might we consider? So let's just start among the family. Do the six University of California medical schools really need six separate IRBs, six separate medical school curricula taught by six different faculties? Could we all work together, perhaps with better results and certainly at lower cost? Maybe the answer to this question could be extended to 143 medical schools. Could we collaborate across schools of medicine nursing, pharmacy, dentistry, and public health such that the education of all of our students receive is pro profoundly enhanced, better preparing them for a future of team-based care or care for a population. We're seeing now how social media is transforming accrual to clinical trials. The same is true in telemedicine and home monitoring for chronic disease management. The technology of process improvement, lean, isn't new, but its broader use in our education, research, and clinical processes could bring profound new benefits. And we're seeing this in organizations across the country, from Virginia Mason to Theta Care, and, and even in our UC campuses. Let me acknowledge the many wonderful and creative ways, approaches to carrying out our missions already in place at our centers. We have great work going on in the education community. We have great innovation going on in clinical care and there's great work going on on the research environment. But I personally believe we've just scratched the surface. We can do so much more 
but only if we embrace profound, meaningful changes to our time-honored, treasured, and now increasingly ineffective and unaffordable ways of carrying out our missions. Let me just read to you a couple paragraphs from a New York Times article that appeared this week. Duke University withdraws from online course group. Duke University has pull, pulled out of Semester Online, an education consortium that will offer online undergraduate courses for credit after faculty members objected. The consortium announced Tuesday it would offer 11 courses this fall from Boston University, Brandeis, Northwestern University of North Carolina, Notre Dame, and Washington University in St. Louis. But the Arts and Sciences Council at Duke, which represents faculty members from the university's largest undergraduate college, voted 16 to 14 last week against participating in the consortium. As late as early March, there was no generalized opposition to joining Semester Online, but when the proposal was circulated in March, some people who've not heard of it before or not paid sufficient attention got concerned. Now here's the essence of it. When Dr. Lang saw the consortium as expanding the courses available to Duke students, some faculty members worried that long-term effect might be for the university to offer fewer courses and hire fewer professors. Others said there had been inadequate consultation with the faculty. There's great opportunity for collaboration, but there's a perfect example of how our structures and our commitment to the traditions of how we've always done things is holding back real progress. As I reflect back on my career, I'm reminded how much we as an industry have changed. In 1980, UCLA had a screening clinic in the lobby of the medical center to determine which patients to accept based on their teaching value. An OB chair once told me that his department had no interest in catching healthy babies. Patient satisfaction and quality and safety were not measured in any systematic way and our performance on all of them by today's standards was poor. Our hospital was highly inefficient by today's standards, and back then when we set our hospital rates each year, the insurance companies dutifully paid them. Why don't we go back to that? Oh no, that's not my speech here. We set our rates, the insurance companies paid them. So why do we look differently today? The simple answer is we changed when we had to. Not when we wanted to, not when we saw it coming, we did it when we had to. When, when managed care and DRGs became a reality in the 1980s, we didn't like it. We were vociferous in our opposition, but we changed and became more efficient. When ACGME approved the first duty hour limitations in 2001, academic medical center community did not like it. But we adapted, and along the way, we've likely saved many lives and many careers. When severe federal research penalties were assessed to some high-profile institutions in the 1990s, we were all concerned. And then we upgraded our own research practices. When the IOM quality and safety reports were issued, and when Medicare first introduced HCAPs and value-based purchasing, we weren't enthusiastic. But today, our academic medical centers are putting patients first, delivering the safest and highest quality care in our history. We're not strangers to change. We've changed in response to all kinds of market, regulatory, and legislative changes in the past. But I'd argue, ladies and gentlemen, that today is different. Until today, we've not been asked, much less forced, to completely reconceptualize the very way we achieve our core purposes. But that's exactly what society is asking and demanding of us. Do more, do it better, do it with far fewer resources. If we fail, we face the real prospect of being displaced by a disruptive innovator outside our community who dares to think differently about how to achieve our core purposes. And we're already seeing the signs of it. Cancer Treatment Centers of America doing some very innovative things. We're seeing it in these for-profit medical schools. The, the prospect of disruptive innovation is very real. I would like to start the video. 
Some of you may be old enough to remember when this originally aired. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information purification directives. We created for the first time in all history a garden of pure ideology where each worker may bloom, secure from the pests of a contradictory On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. So I know some of you here weren't born in 1984. <laughs> this was uh, the commercial that, that aired during the Super Bowl in 1984. And as you look at it, it's, uh, in a lot of ways, it's helpful. You consider how our lives have changed in so many ways since the Macintosh. We've, our lives have been vastly improved by people who dared to think differently. Whether it was Steve Jobs, who brought us devices that we didn't even know we needed and now can't live without, or a Mark Zuckerberg, who took an idea and knitted together a world, or a Mark Benioff, who looked into the cloud and found a revolutionary way to deliver software, or even in our academic community, UCSF Nobel Prize winner Stan Prusner defied conventional scientific wisdom and showed how a protein could cause neurodegenerative disease, something that was not accepted as a possibility. They were like the young woman in this commercial. They dared to think differently and as a result changed our world. Some of us may have been lulled into becoming those people sitting on the benches. But I'd argue that each of us needs to either become that young woman with the courage to challenge the status quo, or a leader who creates a protected zone where others can safely challenge our traditional thinking. We have learned that great ideas can come from anywhere. Postdocs, residents, patients, students, frontline nurses, even from people who never finished college, like Mark Zuckerberg. As Collins and Porus tell us, we must continue to hold close to our hearts those immutable core purposes that are the essence of what we do in academic medicine. But society is giving us this new charge, and if we choose to see it as such, this great opportunity to become a hotbed for radical new thinking about how we achieve our core purpose. I will conclude with the central questions that I believe we as leaders in academic medicine must answer. First, are we as leaders genuinely open to hearing and accepting what society is saying to us about doing more, doing it better, and doing it at drastically lower cost? It's hard to hear, it's hard to accept, but I, I think that is the first central question. Second, do we as leaders have the courage to challenge and retire long-standing structures and academic cultures whose utility has passed? Do we as leaders have the courage to embrace collaboration with entirely new partners and use entirely new tools to achieve our missions? Do we as leaders have the courage to nurture, protect, and celebrate those who challenge us, our traditions, and the way we've always done our work? And do we as leaders have the courage to take the necessary personal and professional risks to put in place new ways to achieve our core purpose? I think the answer to all these has to be a resounding yes. I don't minimize for an instant the complexity of what I'm suggesting to you. It won't be easy. This opportunity is dressed in overalls and looks like work. And the political risks to those driving change are significant. I just know that the moment for action is here. We need to think differently about academic medicine. Our students, 
our residents, our faculty and staff, our patients, our communities, in fact, our nation and the world are depending on us. They believe that we can do it. They believe we can do it. We've got to believe we can do it. We have to do it. And I believe in the end, we will do it. Thank you. Okay. We have a little time for comments and questions or rebuttal. Mark, thank you for that talk. I can't think of any other sector that is being asked to shrink itself in the way that health care is at the same time as expanding the reach. And I think about this, um, I happen to have a family member who's a chief investment officer for a major bank. And when we think in terms of how can we fulfill our obligation to our shareholders, the people of California, what's the future when we're being asked to shrink and yet expand what we're able to do? I think that's a great, great question, uh, Terry. Uh, I think we can, we can react to it in, in any number of ways. We could do the predictable, time-honored way, which is throw up our hands and say it can't be done. Uh, but I think, as again, I think if we don't do it, somebody's going to figure out how to do it for us. Uh, I think we, we have to step up, uh, up to this, and it's going to be, be an enormous challenge. One of the things we hear in Washington when we go back to ask for more money or we go back to ask that the cuts be stopped or uh, mitigated in some ways, uh, David Feinberg was talking about how when he visited the California State Legislature, legislature and to talk about support for GME, we don't, people aren't resonating with our, our case. They're saying, you guys, you guys have lived a special life. You guys are, are, are rich. You're, you don't need extra money. Uh, GME, when we're talking about cutting food stamps, we're kind of talking about cutting, uh, throwing people off Medi-Cal rolls, uh, it's not happening. The other thing that we have done a poor job of is making the case of how we use our dollars. And we hear over and over again in Washington, all you do in academic medicine is say, here's how much money we need, throw it over the wall and hand it to us, and we'll do our good thing with it. And we've done a lot of good things with it. But there's a new level of accountability that's really being asked for. So I don't think, Terry, we have a choice but to figure out how to respond uh, to this, this set of challenges. Please. The University of California is not a nimble organization, uh, and that is a challenge for us uh, not only in the healthcare sector uh, of the university, but just in general. And uh, in order for us to respond uh, to many of these challenges, we have to become more nimble. And we have a lot of shackles. Um, and I was just, would like to ha have you address what you think are the solutions to that to help us become more nimble. Well, that's why uh, I think it's a great point. We are not nimble. Um, and this is what we look to Dr. Stobo to solve for us. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's why we have a senior vice president. I, uh, I do think, though, that uh, through Dr. Stobo's leadership, uh, uh, frankly, there's been some great progress made in, in members of the Board of Regents beginning to understand that the, the world that we're operating in, the academic medical world, the clinical world, is an extremely competitive one. And we can't operate in the, the non-nimble way that we have in the past. And so I'm optimistic that there's a, the realization is starting to, uh, to take root at the highest levels of the university. That there's something different needs to happen uh, in order to allow us to compete more effectively. I think that's, that's going to be a, an enabling tool. But I think then we have to figure out how are we going to become more nimble ourselves. And how do we start to take on decision-making processes. How do we get the best of the collaboration and the, and the communication, the consultation that makes an academic world so great? And how do we compress that, do it fully and, and, and a, in a meaningful way? But how do we then turn that into meaningful 
uh, action. And I think that's the issue that we're going to have to take on ourselves. But I think when we look at who are our competitors, it isn't other major academic medical centers. In every one of our markets, it's their smaller uh, or maybe even large uh, community hospitals or health systems that have one focus, and, and they are designed to fulfill that focus more efficiently than we do. Thank you. Mark, I'm uh, Ralph Green from UC Davis. And um, we've met previously. You've been a strong supporter of uh, one of the programs that uh, you mentioned in your very inspiring delivery, <clears throat> and that is that the one of the advantages that we have is the collective power of our organization and the capacity to cooperate, uh, to eliminate to some extent redundancies, and to amalgamate our potential. So specifically, one of the things that we're doing, and we have a poster here, my colleague and mentee, Dr. Ju Song, has been uh, moving forward the initiative to work together in the laboratory medicine pathology departments. Uh, there are many other examples as well I see from some of the posters around here that have taken root. And I think that we have a tremendous potential to use those opportunities to grow even bigger rather than competing among ourselves to compete outside of the UC. And so I think that this forum is an excellent opportunity to do so and serve as a seedbed for other such uh, uh, ventures. Thank you. Extremely well said, and I couldn't agree more. Hi, Mark. Thank Thanks you. for your comments. Uh, Steve Panelat at UCSF. I, I, was, I really liked your slide uh, that said, um, uh, change is good, uh, you go first. Uh, and I think that's exactly right. The change is, in fact, difficult. And there are winners and losers uh, when we change. And even if we can see a vision for the future of what it looks like, we know that on the road there are going to be people who will benefit from that change and, and have a better future, and there will be inevitably losers. And I, I'm just wondering how we should be thinking about that. And is there what, what do we do to sort of mitigate uh, the losses to perhaps lower the barriers to change and how, how you think about that and maybe perspective on change in the past. Well, I, I should turn the question around to you, Steve. Steve is, uh, <laughs> leads our palliative care program, so maybe he knows best about uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, talking about loss. Uh, I, I, I do think, uh, Steve, we, one thing that will help us is a clearer vision of what an ideal state looks like. I think we're not sure what that is today. And I think that view varies whether you're a regent or the president of the university or a chancellor or a dean or a department chair or a hospital CEO. And I think our first job is to come together and say, this is what we think an optimal state is. Maybe it doesn't optimize this mission, but it does the best job of that mission in the context of the others and, and, and optimizes it in the market but as well working with the, uh, the individual campus and part of the university, carrying out our public mission and so forth. There's a lot of issues that we need to balance. And, but I think if we can develop a clear sense of what that future state looks like, it will be clear that there are going to be some winners and losers along the way. But if we, can, if we can slowly iterate ourselves to that over some period of time, which is what my big worry is is that the changes are coming at us so rapidly we won't have the time to do a thoughtful, uh, rational uh, uh, modification of our structures or processes. But if we do, I think that's the way we, we start to get there. But until we have that clear sense of where we're going, I think this just feels like uh, precipitous or uh, arbitrary uh, changes being forced on us either by uh, the feds or the state or by the hospital or the chancellor or the dean. Great, thanks. Thank you. Hi, Mark. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeff Belcora. I'm at UCSF. Thanks for your remarks. And uh, I guess I, I, I would like your thoughts uh, on, on you as a CEO, others with fiduciary responsibilities to the organization. Um, you know, how, and you probably have lawyers and things counseling you not to show weakness. And yet, how do, you, how do you move forward? How do leaders move forward acknowledging and being humble about the weaknesses we have and the failures we have without exposing our organization to attack by people whose 
motives maybe to you know destroy us or or take it down or you know I, it, it seems like a real challenge. I'm curious about your thoughts. Yeah, it's a terrific question, uh, Jeff. You know, my my sense is that uh, all of this starts with uh, trust and transparency, and uh, uh, it, it's difficult in working. Uh, uh, with uh, the unions uh, right now, uh, they they feel aggrieved. Uh, they've you know they've experienced what many in the UC have experienced: uh, rising health care premium costs, increased contributions to their pension, so forth. And and the particular issue at hand for AFSCME and UPTI uh, and CNA is the introduction of a new, still very generous pension tier in, in July. Uh, you know, I, I respect that, and, and I think we need to hear what it is that they're, that they're arguing, and hopefully they'll hear what we're, we're arguing. But to answer the question, at least at a personal level, the way I, I reconcile all this is trying to go back to what is it that society is really asking of us? What, is the, what does the University of California expect of us as these University of California medical centers and, and medical schools. And yes, there's the broad mission that they want uh, handled. They want us to do our fair share of, of public service. Uh, they, but they, they also expect and increasingly rely on us to be financially self-supporting. They cannot have, they cannot afford this, this $10 billion enterprise, or how big is it, Jack, the, the medical, seven. Well, maybe if the health plans help us, we can get to 10 next year. But this big, big clinical enterprise, uh, it can't, it is so big and so much is on its back that it cannot fail. So when, when we make a decision about how do we look at reducing the number of FTE, it's not because there are people saying we don't need these people around anymore, but we benchmark ourselves with each other we benchmark across the country. Others have figured out a way to do some of these things with less labor. We make that judgment. We don't want to do it, but, but society is saying we're not going to pay you. Uh, I, I don't know if we'll hear uh, uh, from uh, some of our health plan friends uh, later, later today, but uh, clearly the idea of we've, we've had uh, price-based uh, costing, or we've we've developed our prices based on what our costs are, and increasingly society is saying you've got to develop your prices, you've got to cut your costs to what we can afford to pay you, and I think that's a whole new mindset that we have to accept. So, I take our my fiduciary responsibility very seriously, not only to running the hospital, but also making sure that the entire academic enterprise thrives, and it's a hard message to uh, always communicate. Thank you. Are we done? We have. I think we can just stop uh, at the, the last. Okay, one. we'll do two more. Hi, I'm, I'm Shelley Greenfield from UC yes, Irvine. Sure. I wanted to uh, ask you about another set of colleagues. Uh, many people in this room, I'm sure, resonate to your inspiring remarks and call for action. But we also have on the other side our scientific colleagues who would accuse us often, the implementers and the scientific part of implementation, which is evaluation, of being uh, anti innovation and too conservative. Do you see the two paradigms working together uh, in, in the same institution? After all, business often doesn't, an industry. That is a scientific paradigm as we know it, and at the same time, on an equal basis, a paradigm that uh, treats implementation and implementation, implementation science as an equal. Well, this is a topic that's worth a, worth a lot of discussion. I'll, I'll make two far too simplistic uh, uh, comments. Uh, the first is that, that I think we have, in the University of California, greatly undervalued the science of implementation, the science of process improvement, the science of integration, science of collaboration. Uh, that's not been viewed as, as uh, promotion worthy, and, and there's not a lot of NIH dollars behind it and thus it, it gets less valued. And I think that becomes uh, a, real, a real challenge uh, uh, for us. I, I think the, uh, the, the other issue is that even when we've had innovation and we know the innovation is there that we should implement, 
Uh, we often get stuck because we become addicted to the reimbursement system that, that supports the status quo. And uh, that's something that we, we really need to take a long, hard look at ourselves to say, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing the thing that is the most pragmatic? And, uh, and we, it, it takes real courage to say, toss that revenue generating thing overboard because we don't believe it's putting us in the right, right place. And I think over time, that's what we have to do. We have to take those kind of bold steps in order to force ourselves to make the full transition to a, a new model of care, a new delivery, new delivery system. You may have just answered my question. Uh, Maurice Herblin with United Healthcare, medical director. Uh, when we look at um, you know the infrastructure of healthcare today, so much of it is a heads and beds business, you know, with inpatient care. And when we look at performance-based, value-based contracting, you know, we have a very fierce competitor in California, being Kaiser, that you know has a rolled-up model. How do you envision the UC system being able to transition from a financial standpoint to get away from? that model to more of a value-based, performance-based model? Yeah, well, I, I think this is a, a great topic that uh, Dr. Stobo at, at some point may want to have a special session on, but I, I'll just say briefly that I think every one of the UC med centers and clinical enterprises uh, is recognizes that the world is changing from a fee-for-service world to a prepaid world or at least a, a case price world and that that is inherently going to require us to accept and manage risk in a better way. It's going to make, force us to make decisions about what is the most efficient place or provider to deliver care. And that may not always be in our centers in the, in the way that we've, we've done it. I think, uh, just say for UCSF, we're kind of focusing on a couple of broad market strategies. One strategy is we want to be the regional referral center for high-end tertiary quaternary care. Uh, that's probably always going to be on a fee-for-service basis. As we get referrals from Kaiser, uh, they'll likely pay us a case rate as they currently do and for many of those services. Uh, but the bigger part of what we would like to transition to is being part of an accountable care organization where we are one part of a larger system at, where our rewards come because we've more effectively managed risk, we've kept the population healthy, we've kept them out of the hospital, uh, and along the way, we've shown our residents and students this is the future of, of healthcare. It isn't just necessarily about being exceptional and managing tertiary and quaternary inpatients. I think we see that future. The getting from where we are today to that point is going to be arduous, and it's going to require partnerships of the UCs with the Uniteds and the Blue Shields and the Anthems and others to better understand how to do that. So I, I look forward to that partnership and I feel uh, very optimistic about uh, the road ahead. So thank you all very much. Thanks for your time.